Okay, so uh, we'll start with the Heart Sutra. It's a really good sutra to become uh, quite familiar with and it needs a lot of repetition for it to make sense. So um, your own copy of it is in this green book, How Things Exist. It's in the back in the appendices on page 166. 115 on page 115. I'll do share screen. So if you don't have it right in front of you, that's okay. But um, if you're ever wanting to look at it in your own time, it's on page 115 in the green book. So thinking about the words as we say them, uh, I prostrate to the Arya triple gem. Thus did I hear at one time, the Bhagawan was dwelling on mass of vultures mountain in Rajagriha together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharivadiputra, Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. No visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomena. There is no eye element, and so on, up to and including no mind element, and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisoha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commanded the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the Venerable Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the worlds of gods, humans, asuras, and gandavas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. Okay, so just sitting with that, Maybe a different sentence resonated with you than last time. 
Maybe there's some portion of it that is ringing in your mind, either a new understanding or a new question. And you can relax your attention. Okay, so um, Karina sent me some questions that you guys had been having. Um, if it works to, you know, have them written down by Karina and sent to me, we can just keep doing that. Sometimes it can make the questions clearer. Um, but of course, during class, if you have a, a question, you can ask same as always as well. Um, but I think it is a good discipline sometimes, at least, if, um, if you kind of workshop the question and like narrow it down to what is the actual doubt or what is the actual confusion, then it's going to mean the answer can land more easily and it might make sense. So um, here's a few of the questions. The first one was, please explain slowly the four seals. Um, the four seals, again, are basically related to what makes you a holder of Buddhist tenets. So to be a holder of Buddhist tenets, you need to adhere to the four seals. Um, it doesn't mean uh, you're necessarily I guess, a Buddhist refuge holder. You can be someone who identifies as Buddhist, who doesn't even understand the four seals. But um, if you understand the four seals and you kind of adhere to them or believe in them, that means you're a Buddhist tenant holder. So they are, one, all com compositional phenomena are impermanent. Meaning anything that is produced, anything that comes together, disintegrates or changes moment to moment. Two, all contaminated phenomena are by nature suffering. The contamination that's being spoken of here is contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions or negative states of mind. So anything that is created by or driven by karma and disturbing emotions is going to be suffering either in an obvious way or in a subtle way, but definitely if it's contaminated, it's suffering. Three, all phenomena are empty of self-existence or are selfless or lack inherent existence or lack true existence, all phenomena. So that means impermanent phenomena, permanent phenomena. That means People, places, things, situations, existence, non-existence, absolutely everything is empty of inherent existence. And then nirvana is true peace. Nirvana is related to liberation. So we're talking about liberation from cyclic existence, um, a state beyond sorrow. We're not necessarily talking about Buddhahood enlightenment. So it's important to understand that Theravadan scholars, um, people that hold the Pali tradition, think slightly differently about these four seals than Mahayana scholars and the different tenant schools approach them differently, but they use the same basic words. So part of the reason the four seals aren't totally clear is that they're not described the same in every tenant school. So if you can get kind of a general sense of what's meant, then we can start going into some nuances and going into more specifics. So yeah, um, Rana, did you have a, a follow-up? Yeah, I sent this question, one of the questions that I sent because um, the last part that you referred to, we read in the text that um, the, uh, one of the tenets uh, believes that while um, um, objects have uh, are, are not 
um, do not um, uh, exist uh, inherently, but the, the self does. And so it- Or other way around, it, yeah. Or the other way. Anyway, it contradicts the, the seals. So I got confused. Yeah, yeah, they de they definitely do seem to contradict. Um, they they more are levels of subtlety rather than contradictions. It's like there's a coarse way of looking at them, and then there's a more subtle way of looking at them. the The whole premise with tenants is that not everyone is ready to hear the truth explicitly and directly. It will fry their brain, <laughs> right? or it will rock their worldview so fundamentally that they'll slide into wrong views and forget about ethics. And this is very important training for us as just regular people who are trying to help others, isn't it? It's like, just because something's true doesn't mean people have the ears to hear it. And it doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be said. You know, like when do you actually speak the truth to people and at what level? You know, if your child has their pet die and they say, what happens to my pet after death? You're going to say a slightly different version of your worldview than if your child is like a teenager, you know, or a young adult or a total adult. You might say the same worldview, but you're going to present it in a different way given their state of mind, right? It would be not compassionate to kind of, you know, just give them the brutal truth, unfiltered, totally direct and explicit without any context if they were five years old. And they also wouldn't be able to process it anyway, right? And so the Buddha was very skillful in recognizing that all sentient beings are equal in having Buddha nature, right? They're totally equal in having Buddha nature. They're all equal in being empty of inherent existence, they're all equal in having clear and knowing fundamental consciousnesses. And then time went by, right? And different experiences happened to these different mental continuums. So all of our mental continuums are of an identical type, but they've had different interactions and different experiences and different things that have allowed either quick growth or slow growth or somewhere in between. So it's not like a value judgment, you know, it's not saying lower sentient beings in the sense of like bad or unsophisticated. It's more like they just haven't matured yet. So you have to present the view in a way that is accessible and going in the right direction, even though it's not the finished form yet, because too quick people lose ethics, too quick people lose touch with conventional reality and then aren't able to relate in a way that's healthy. Does, I mean, does that, that make sense? The way that the tenants are presented or the why tenants are presented in this kind of graded way? Even if you don't understand the tenants or the seals, just the whole concept of, you know, you don't wanna rush things with some folks. You know, there's, there's a premise that kind of new age folks, bless their hearts, um, say, which is, you know, like there are old souls, right? Which is kind of like, <laughs> I don't know, a little bit of a trip, but um, you know, there are some people who obviously have learned their lessons well in previous lives and some people who haven't had the resources or the conditions for certain basic things to kind of connect. And we would say, of course, all of us are the same age, beginningless time, yada, yada, yada. But you do, you know, if you see two children of the exact same age in front of you who have had similar conditions and similar family background and similar socioeconomic status and whatever, whatever, and maybe even test at the same level in terms of math and science and whatever, emotionally, they are gonna process things at different speeds. You know, and it's not to say one is better than the other. It's just one is myelinated or, you know, matured in terms of their spiritual growth more because they've had more conditions that have facilitated that. So one of the Bodhisattva vows is not to teach emptiness to those who are unripe, <laughs> meaning those who aren't ready. 
Um, and, you know, and I've had this experience before where I'm so used to this conversation, it comes very easily. And I'll just kind of throw it out there to some smart person, probably smarter than me, probably much more sophisticated in their logic than me. But for some reason, this topic doesn't have any space to land. And they immediately go, oh, emptiness must mean nothingness. And that's a crazy worldview. And it sounds nihilistic. Or emptiness must mean that uh, good can be bad and bad can be good and there's no such thing as anything and we can call a tree a coffee pot and, you know, what is reality anyway and people get weird, right? So just so it's not about mere intelligence. You know, some people with very average intelligence get this concept very easily and some people who are very smart just can't get it. And it's work from previous lives, it's familiarity, it's merit. So part of the reason we read the Heart Sutra at the beginning of the class is to accumulate the merit of wisdom bundle so that hopefully we have more chance of understanding the rest of the class. And this is a very common thing that you'll see in monasteries and nunneries is there's this whole like prayer extravaganza before class starts. And it's basically to try and clear all the obstacles and generate some momentum so that the content can land. So um, yeah, thoughts, thoughts about four seals and this approach, kind of ideas or things it reminds you of? Another uh, little thing about uh, the definition of um, compounded uh, phenomena. Mm -hmm. So um, mind, is also uh, a compounded phenomenon. It's yeah, yeah. And yep. so it's impermanent. Yep. But we say that it exists for eons and eons. Yes. So remember that impermanent and permanent don't have the same meaning in Buddhism as they have in English or probably Hebrew. Remember, impermanent means changes. It doesn't mean ends necessarily, right? It can have a continuity that lasts forever. You know, it's, it's the idea like a river, you know, like a river can go from here to there, but every second of the river is different because it's always moving and changing. And permanent in Buddhism means like static. Yeah, non-momentary. It doesn't mean eternal, right? It means while it exists, it's not changing. You know, so like there's some space in my cup. The space in my cup is not changing moment to moment. But if I fill up the cup all the way, the space in the cup is gone. So it doesn't last forever, but while it's alive, quote alive, it's not changing. Cool. Yeah. No, I know. And I know we have to repeat these things for them to stick. So don't worry about asking, you know, stuff that we've covered before, because it does take a while for it to just get in there, especially when it's words that we use in other contexts. So um, compounded, produced, impermanent are generally speaking synonyms in Buddhism. In the Heart Sutra, you say uh, uh, that I will bow to the completeness of wisdom and it's the mother of all victory in all times. But, and then you say no, no uh, wisdom, no, like there's nothing, no wisdom and no not wisdom. Like, so why do you bow to the perfection of wisdom if it's not, it's not there there's no not no such thing is is that what it's saying <laughs> it says, <laughs> the, sut the heart sutra says i will bow to the perfection of sutra yes and in the in the sutra you say uh, emptiness is a uh, form form is emptiness there is a uh, also uh, also about wisdom there is a sentence here I have to yeah, find Ona, you're, you're answering your own question, right? You're answering okay. your own question, but you don't realize that you are. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. You could spend your whole life thinking about that sentence. 
but basically it's saying ultimate truth and relative truth exist at the same time in the same place. And there are two ways of viewing reality. There's the distorted way and there's the not distorted way. So what we're doing is we're working with the fact that all we know is the distortion. That's all we know right now. But we're getting closer to wisdom because we recognize that there is a distortion. There is a projection. There's a superimposition. You know, even basic psychology understands projection, right? Just basic, like you could learn it in high school as a 17 year old, we project what we think reality is. You know, this is not rocket science. But then there's subtler and subtler levels of what is even the self that I'm projecting? What is even the thoughts that I think are mine? What is even anything, right? Which doesn't mean nothing, right? So whenever you're hearing empty, finish the sentence. Don't leave it hanging in your mind. Even when we speak in shorthand and we say, this is empty, that is empty. We're always saying empty of inherent existence. It doesn't have inherent existence. That's what you have to always hear in your head. And I know the shorthand of Buddhism can sound nihilistic. It really can, and it's frustrating. But what it's trying to do is to show you that absolutely everything you think you can hang on to with solidity only exists within a context, you know, which you already understand intellectually, right? You already understand everything exists in terms of context. But then when you have a conflict with someone, it feels very like the opposite, you know? Like you think, sure, sure, everything exists um, in terms of context. Sure, no problem. And then you hold up, you know, I don't know, your favorite cup to someone and you say, isn't this beautiful? And they say, no. Conflict, done. For you, it's beautiful. For them, it's ugly. Psh, conflict, you know? So we have our opinions and we can have opinions and we should have opinions, but we need to hold them lightly with this awareness of only from my very limited worldview, from my very specific ex set of experiences from beginningless time, does this look like reality? It is not the reality. Yeah, so it's like form is empty, emptiness is form, is basically saying water is a wave and a wave is water. Do you understand? Ish? Yeah, so why do we prostrate to anything? Why do we bow to anything? Because we become receptive to what we respect, right? We listen deeply when we think something's important. Right? The Buddhas don't need us to bow to them. Nobody needs us to bow to them. The Buddhas don't care, right? It's, it's completely for our own mind. It's a psychological thing, right? Because if you think this is ordinary poetry, you hear it like ordinary poetry. If you think this is profound, then you hear it as profound and then it can have an effect on your life. So, so I'm just wondering where it feels a little bit, and this could just be a cultural thing, so, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels a little bit like there's some like aggression with the content, you know, like you're upset at the content <laughs> when, when you ask the question like this, like you're mad at something, like you're mad at the idea of bowing or, or is, is that true or am I misreading it? Do you have a frustration in there? If you ask me, I just don't get it. That's all. I'm <laughs> sorry. No, no, that's I'm totally fine. In that sense, just yeah, no, that's okay. It's too big. Yeah. It's too big. As you said, I don't know where. I don't have any place to put it in. As I said before, if you would say everything is so full that it's absolutely full, this world, I would say, Amen. Yes, it's everything is full. When you say it with the emptiness. I cannot, even though I know that each cell in my body has some empty in it. Otherwise, no, no atoms and neurons and protons would go there. I know there is some uh, reek, some emptiness in every cell. So I know there is representation of nothingness in, in everything, but still I cannot. Yeah, and I think that you're hearing the word wrong. I think okay. that you hear you hear you hear emptiness, 
and you and you think space right which is an analogy that we use for emptiness but when we say empty we're not saying space right we're, we're saying uh, an aspect right so things are empty of what they're empty of like independence they're empty of being one thing you know, which, which is quite easy, right? You understand how nothing is one thing. You know, there's that famous Virginia Woolf quote, right? For, no, for nothing was ever one thing. So it's like you hold up the book and you go, this is one thing. It's one book. But if you think for two seconds, you know, of course, it's also many pages and a cover and this side and that side and this side and books only exist because of creators of books and language and paper and, you know, suddenly, you know, the whole world of dependent arising opens up to you. But the immediate appearance is it's one thing. And that's the illusion that we're talking about. That's the illusion of, of conventional relative truth is that things seem to be one thing and they seem to exist by themselves from themselves they really do seem that way just immediately you know that's a good person they're my friend i like them they make me happy all very kind of concrete solid you know that's an annoying person they frustrate me i want them away from me it's all very concrete solid and of course as people that are doing introspective work all the time you do know better, <laughs> you know, you know better than that, but it takes a second, you know, you stop and you go, I'm irritated and annoyed by this person because they remind me of these things and they don't fulfill those expectations, all of which are very specific and personal to me, some of which go with a social contract and societal norms, but context, you know, I only like this person because blah, 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 right? You, you know that like with a couple of seconds of thought, but it's not your like immediate appearance, is it? That's the illusion. So things are empty of existing in that illusory way, which seems to be one unchanging, fixed, obvious, self-created thing. It doesn't mean they don't exist. They just don't exist in the way they appear. So, so it's definitely is, as you described, there's this fullness and this everythingness and in a way that is the same as the nothing. Because nothing is really saying like not by itself, not all by itselfness, right? And so what we're doing with this work is we're kind of going back and forth between what seems to be the case and what is actually the case with a lot of different categories and a lot of different levels of subtlety. And intellectually, we're gonna be going deeper than we're able to go emotionally. But gradually, they'll meet up. And what we understand intellectually to be true will sink in and actually change our behavior. Why do we want to do that? Because we want to have some peace in our life. We want to have some happiness in our life more than what we already have and from that place, we can be of greater benefit to others. You know, like the whole point of the conversation is because of believing the illusion, we struggle and we hurt each other, right? So if we didn't believe in this lie, we would be so much kinder and so much more effective. So tenants can sound very dry on the surface, you know, philosophy this and kind of like, a little overwhelming, but whenever we get stuck, just keep coming back to things appear to inherently exist when the opposite is the case. Every time I believe in the lie, I reinforce negative patterns. Every time I see through it, I open myself up more and I'm happier and more effective. And that's whether or not you believe in past and future lives. You know, that can just be today. So I don't know, is, if the, let me know if that's helping or clarifying or not, S slowly. So we, we just need to really um, have a lot of patience, I think, with this topic and kind of let words sit and kind of percolate and just really mull them over. Um, a lot of this topic, I, 
I couldn't understand the first time I heard it in class. I had to go back home and just think about it on purpose a lot. You know, you, you really have to like make this a, pro a thought project for yourself when you're by yourself in a quiet moment, you know, going for a walk or exercising or just sitting at home, just think deeply. What does that mean? And what is its impact on life? You know, just really make it personal because otherwise it's never going to sink in. And um, there's only so much we can do talking. It's different than like compassion because before you met Buddhism, you already knew compassion in some way. You know, you already liked it. You already understood it. You thought it was a good idea. Like it, you didn't need to be sold on compassion, right? You thought, yay, compassion. Um, so you already had a foothold. We had something we could talk about that we already had experience of. But when we're talking about the experience of the lack of inherent existence, we don't have any foothold. We don't have any experience of that. The only experience we have is understanding dependent arising a little bit, which is looking at surface context, but we need to go deeper. Yeah, sorry, it's not. Yeah, I think maybe I'll talk for myself. Part of the stress maybe you're feeling is the fact that Wednesday was so hard to comprehend. It was so fast. And maybe that's part of the stress because talking to you makes everything so much uh, understandable and we can grasp in it. And on Wednesday, it was just so fast. And uh, so maybe that's part of the stress about it. I think that makes sense. And, um, and I can re record those um, with a bit more space in them or a little bit more slowly. It's, it's the sort of thing where why I sent you the PowerPoint slides as well is like once you've heard it, then read at your own speed, you know, like go back over it. And I'm not going to bring in more information about tenants right away. Like that's kind of that presentation, we need to unpack a lot. So we're not going to like just keep doing more and more of that speed and more and more of that density. It's kind of like that same one. Now we're going to unpack for a while. And we're only going to be doing these lower schools for like, I don't know, a few more weeks. And then we're going to be going into the middle way consequence view for the rest of the semester. So, um, you know, it's important to know about the lower tenants, but that's not going to be the main thing. Next Wednesday, um, I, uh, I thought it'd be useful if we also reviewed a little bit of last semester so you didn't lose what you learned. Um, so we'll do a, you know, like a summary of everything about Shine and then a summary about everything about the 12 links. So I'll do a couple of those too. And um, just kind of keep letting the tenants stuff digest, you know, don't squeeze your mind. I, I remember the first time I heard about tenants, I was just, I was kind of, I think just overwhelmed, you know, and kind of like, I kind of got some pieces and I got the general idea, but it, it took some repetition before it really touched my heart and it's still really in process. Um, and it's one of those things where I'm usually a student of tenants. I'm not usually a teacher of tenants. Um, so it's, it's a big topic for me as well. And I'll do my best with it. And I hope I can do it justice um, for all of our sakes. But it is a hard subject. And not all of the topics of <laughs> human spirit are this hard. It's, it's probably the hardest one. And everything's easier after this as well. So just know that. Um, I think a few things that keep you oriented or keep me oriented anyway, is just to think how has science evolved over time in terms of its relationship with reality? You know, what does quantum physics say about matter? What does neuroscience say about identity? Because, you know, like you guys, I grew up, you know, with science in my life, you know, and with biology and basic psychology. And these were things that are kind of like modern society's religion, even though a lot of these things exist in the realm of theory and we don't really understand either. They're kind of more comfortable for us. We have faith in science. So there's a lot of like cross fertilization you can do by thinking about what you know about science. And there's some really interesting dialogues with His Holiness the Dalai Lama 
and quantum physicists and neuroscientists in a series called Mind and Life. The Mind and Life series, he does these conferences usually once a year and gradually he's bringing in more psychologists and psychoanalysts as well. And um, this can be really interesting because it's really a secular conversation with our philo philosophical conversation and there's a lot in common. What's different about Buddhism is it's not just in the level of information, it's in the level of then who are you anyway in, in relation to this world? You know, what is our impact on each other? What is our responsibility to one another? You know, all that stuff starts to come into play. So slowly, slowly, <laughs> slowly, slowly. Okay, so um, we're gonna do just a tiny bit of um, some of the other questions as well. And I really appreciate your questions. So um, let's see. This, the ones about the lower schools, I'm going to come back to when we come back to the Vibashikas. Um, I think that karma is a conversation that I'm going to flesh out a little bit next week when we review the 12 links. But this one, number four, how can an ignorant mind start awakening? Um, there's a really excellent section in um, one of your books here. So I'll just pull it up on the screen. So in How Things Exist, you see on page 40, if you're looking at page 40. So on page 40, it says, we have the responsibility of bringing others to peerless happiness of full enlightenment. Why are we responsible? Because we have received a perfect human rebirth. First of all, the nature of our mind is clear light. We have a mind that has Buddha nature, the nature of a fully enlightened being. The sky is not oneness with clouds. Clouds are temporary. They come and go. Depending on causes and conditions, clouds come. Depending on other causes and conditions, they go, and the sky becomes clear. It's the same with a mirror. Depending on causes and conditions, it can be obscured by dirt. Depending on other causes and conditions, the dirt obscuring the mirror can be cleaned away. The mirror was only temporarily obscured. Our mind is like that. Its nature is clear light and the obscurations, ignorance, attachment, anger, and other disturbing thoughts are temporary, not permanent. Due to causes and conditions, our mind is obscured, but due to other causes and conditions, the obscurations can be cleared away and we can be free from fear guilt, and all other undesirable emotions. It all depends on how we live our life, on what we do with our mind. One way of acting obscures our mind. Another way of acting frees it from obscurations, and it then becomes fully awakened. It even depends on the actions we do each day. One action can obscure our mind. Another can our obscurations and free our mind. How we live our life, what we do with our body, speech, and mind has different aspects on our mind. Different actions have different effects, but mainly it depends on the kind of attitude we have when we act. When we act with a negative attitude, with ignorance, attachment, anger, and other disturbing thought, it affects our mind. It obscures it. But when we live our life with non-ignorance, non-attachment, non-hatred, and other positive attitudes, the effect is positive. It diminishes our obscurations. It purifies or lessens them. When we practice Dharma, depending on how skillfully we practice, it immediately purifies our mind. Our mind is purified that much. Our obscurations become that much thinner. But when we act with body, speech, and mind out of ignorance, attachment, anger, and other negative attitudes, it further obscures our mind. It produces more confusion, etc., etc. So we just have to remember this thing that we already know, which is that nature of our mind is clear light. It is empty of existing from its own side. The mind is a phenomena that the self possesses. It is non-substantial, colorless, shapeless, and clear in nature. It has the ability to perceive objects, and it is not an object of the five senses. That is one way to define the mind. Independence upon this base, a phenomena that has characteristics, 
we have labeled or merely imputed mind. Therefore, there's no mind existing from its own side. There's no real mind from its own side. Mind is nothing other than what we have merely imputed by our mind in dependence upon that base, that particular phenomena. Therefore, there's no such thing as a real mind from its own side. The mind is empty of existing from its own side. That is one definition of the clear light nature of mind, which refers to its ultimate nature. So this clear light mind, this empty nature of the mind, this is that fundamental mind that we touch at the time of death. So you've all done this meditation, the eight stages at the time of death, you know, mirage, billowing smoke, fire sparks, weak red, blue flame, white, red, black, clear light, <clears throat> right? And when you go through all of those stages, those visions are just what happens naturally when your physical elements can no longer support consciousness, right? So while your mind is um, together with coarser elements, you have coarser sensory experiences. As the mind withdraws from those, it goes to its subtler and subtler level to the clear light mind, the fundamental mind. And that mind is what carries the karmic seeds. That's what carries the karmic seeds from life to life. So that clear and knowing consciousness doesn't have any form. It rides on um, like subtle energy wind or like chi, right? When the mind leaves the body, it's just having a purely mental experience. And that little fundamental mind is still empty of inherent existence. It labels itself. <laughs> it's a self-labeling little guy. And that basis is kind of the fundamental basis that we can label self onto. It still is related to the five aggregates. It's just not operating in the coarse sensorial form. It's like the senses kind of become dormant or like sleeping. Yeah. So this relationship between mind and emptiness is very important. Um, we've done a lot of meditations where we're looking at the clarity of the mind, the spacious clarity, which is kind of its relative aspect. And then with a, what's called a Mahamudra meditation, you take that as your example for emptiness. And you say that clear light nature of mind that is spacious is empty of inherent existence. So you're just kind of like imbuing your intellectual knowledge with your mental experience of mind. And you're trying to associate them together in such a way that when you actually die, you're able to recognize it directly. Because if you do that, you can cut samsara very efficiently and have a lot of progress in your future lives. Some people are able to do this way before death. They can control the disillusions of the elements. And, um, you know, by rehearsing them, we come closer to controlling them. So that I mean, can be kind of an interesting practice. But... Um, Anyway, hopefully that helps that question a little bit. I know it's big stuff to flesh out. Um, yes, big stuff to flesh out. Yeah. I sent this question, uh, this is my other one, because of a sentence that it exists with its own freedom. Uh, it's, it's for what page. does, the mind? Uh, I guess so, yeah, the I. Yeah, tell me what page you're looking. 82, in uh, Virtue and Reality. There is the appearance and the belief that it exists with its own freedom without depending on causes and conditions. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's the, that's the, a mistaken view. Yeah, so then I thought if the eye or mind maybe doesn't have a certain degree of uh, freedom, um, its own freedom, then how do we, can, can we start uh, to look for um, a way out of suffering or, I mean, how can we cut this circle of samsara if, it, if there is no, I mean, for me, freedom means uh, choice or free will or something that can, can change the cause and condition that you are that yep. you are yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a yeah right. it's a good question it's a, yeah it's a good question and and it's a uh, a common stuck spot because in one sense it's like we have no free will in another sense of course we have free will 
you know, it's that we don't have any inherently existent free will. So if you're thirsty, you can choose to drink water to relieve the suffering of thirst, right? And you can make that decision. But if you think that you made that decision all by yourself, that's the exaggeration. You know, like you have to know that drinking water quenches thirst. You have to have access to water. You have to have blah, blah, blah. It has to occur to you. Someone needed to teach you something, blah, blah, blah. Like million, million conditions come together for you to just drink some water when you're thirsty. But you're still able to relieve the suffering of thirst yourself with choice. So it's the same, right? It's same. Yeah, so we're able to relieve our suffering, but it means we need to understand the causes of our suffering accurately and make decisions to free ourselves from suffering collaboratively and understanding that we, we don't come to those decisions all on our own or in and of ourselves. This, so this, this thinking is very useful to really think about what is free will exactly? Where does choice come from exactly? And yet, of course, we make them. And every time we're making a choice, consciously on purpose, that is very, very strong karmic seed, either positive or negative. There's lots of things we do kind of half-heartedly, you know, kind of half-intentionally. And those also create karma, but much lesser karma. So anytime we're actually making a decision on purpose, is very powerful, even though we made it independence upon a million other things. Still, it landed here and the seed is planted here on this mental continuum. And this mental continuum will be the one that experiences the results of that, whether good or bad. So the relationship between karma and ethics, the self and emptiness, that is our job, right? Like that's our work. How does that all come together? Um, to say positive states of mind lead to happiness, negative states of mind lead to suffering, sounds all very logical and very tidy. But then you ask, what is good? What is positive? What is constructive? You know, is there any action you can say, is that in and of itself divorced from context? You know, you say, oh, yes, of course, giving food to the hungry. That's, that's inherently good. You know, it is, right? And of course, no, it's not, <laughs> right? It only is in a context, right? In another context, it could be enabling. In another context, it could be disempowering or, you know, sort of, I don't know, disrespectful. In another context, it could be incredibly positive. You know, it's like, it's not good by itself. And you know that already, <laughs> right? You know that already. But the, the, the whole thing is you're realizing that that basic idea of context is going in the direction of this whole conversation of dependent arising, which is the proof for emptiness, right? Dependent arising proves emptiness. Things are empty because they depend. Yeah. So, um, so sitting with that <laughs> and, um, and on Wednesday, you're just going to get a nice little review of Shine and how it relates to this conversation of emptiness and what you do with Shine. So it's going to be review from your last semester, bringing together the topic of this semester. So that's what's happening on Wednesday. So it shouldn't be um, too overwhelming, but if it's, if it's still too fast and too much, I can... I can slow it down. I just don't want you to be bored. <laughs> you know, I want you to be, you know, peppy and engaged. So um, do tell me if it keeps being too fast and I'll slow it down, but um, we'll do our dedication prayer now. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. 
May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, thanks guys.